Hey y'all, welcome back. My chair is squeaky, we know this. Uh, so today is the fourth episode of my She Reads series, Cause She Reads. <laughs> and I'm gonna be talking about uh, one of the last books that I read. It's called The Four Pivots by Dr. Sean Ginwright. Let me go get it. All right, so here's the book. And so today I'm gonna to be going over a few quotes that I really, really loved from this book um, and overall talking about what I thought about it. So if that sounds interesting to you, I'm so glad you're here. Keep on watching. This book is soft cover and it's also like, it's kind of taller uh, than a lot of like the little books I've been reading. Um, I always gotta give it a smell. It smells really good as usual. Um, it's a really easy read. Uh, there's only just over like 220 pages or so, 230 pages. Okay, so the reason why I read this book was because I listened to this interview that Brene Brown did on her podcast, uh, her Dare to Lead podcast, I believe, um, where she interviewed the author, Dr. Sean Jin Wright, and that episode was so good. It was... I just, I was really feeling it. I was really feeling his story. I was really feeling like everything that they were saying. And so I was like, okay, I need to get the book. Um, so basically it's called The Four Pivots and the subtitle is Reimagining Justice, Reimagining Ourselves. Uh, I don't know. The word reimagining was like my word of the year. <laughs> A couple of years ago um, and it's just a word that I really like right now I think it's really important for all of us to like reimagine what kind of life we can live um, and try to achieve that um, but reimagining justice reimagining ourselves essentially this book is about this idea that if we want to be people who care about making a difference in the world um, and care about, you know, fighting injustices. In order to do that, we have to also be doing a lot of self work and a lot of self healing. Um, and that's what the whole podcast was about, which I highly recommend you listen to. You can listen to it on literally BreneBrown.com uh, for free. That's just like an idea that I've like personally been thinking about a lot, about how a lot of like the world's ills mm, can only be solved when we all start, you know, trying to heal the ills within ourselves and within our own spirits, right? Like this idea that <clears throat> when we focus on our own healing, it will help heal the world and heal others, right? Like when you are making decisions from a healed place, from a place that's uh, more conscious than egoic, uh, what ends up happening is that you end up inevitably making good decisions that would help others become freer as well. Um, so it's like a little bit of a woo-woo idea, like either you are with that idea or you're like, that sounds crazy. Um, but for me, it just spiritually makes a lot of sense. So I was excited to like read a book that could help me, I guess, mm, articulate some of these ideas that I've also been having. Um, so yeah, so basically he goes over four different pivots that we all need to make uh, in order to achieve like that self work that will eventually help others. Uh, so the first pivot is from lens to mirror, pivoting from seeing through a lens to seeing things in your world as a mirror to yourself. 
Pivot number two is from transactional to transformative. Pivot three is from problem to possibility. And that was really interesting because that was all about, instead of us as, especially progressives, like we're really good at naming problems in the world, but we're not that great of coming up with new possibilities. That's essentially what it's about. Like how do we change from, instead of just talking about problems to talking about solutions and yeah, possible solutions. And then pivot four is from hustle to flow. Um, so how do we get out of this like addiction to frenzy and into a more flow state um, with our actions, our purpose, our behavior? Oh, also this book, I book clubbed with uh, two or three other people. Um, it was really great to read this with a group of people and to get their perspectives on everything as well. Um, so this is in the section, this is in the introduction. Um, okay. He says, we spend all of our time resisting white supremacy, fighting racism, confronting patriarchy, deconstructing capitalism, challenging oppressive systems, and very little time creating belonging, cultivating healing, inventing new systems, designing our future. I just thought that was like, really well put and I just I think it's so true uh, you know and that's not to say that it's not important to fight racism or white supremacy or patriarchy but we also need to at the same time probably spend even more time creating more belonging cultivating healing inventing new systems designing our future uh, yeah I think that's so important and it's interesting because there is so much resistance to that. I've personally felt like in different work environments, like the resistance to creating a new system or taking the time to figure out how to create something new. Okay, so the second quote is also in the introduction. Um, okay. Dealing with our addictions, insecurities, and unresolved conflicts is way harder than making people aware of the dangers of climate change or fighting against racist policies. But when we don't turn inward to deal with our own stuff, we build up this false idea about power and ultimately build movements with wounded warriors. Our real power comes from the courage to deal with our fractured relationships, the vulnerability to acknowledge our hurt feelings, and the awareness to know when our ego shows up. He's seen in his work, he has a lot of work in nonprofits as well, and as a teacher. And what he notices with and I've noticed this too with some of my really liberal friends who are like out there every day, like fighting all of these injustices. Uh, there's a neglect of self. Uh, and he's saying that we can't neglect ourselves if we're fighting injustices because then you're just bringing a wounded warrior to the battlefield to fight these injustices. Um, so it's similar also to the idea of like putting the mask on yourself before you put it on, uh, you know, your child on an airplane. It's similar to that idea. And I also find that kind of like empowering too, right? Like I think that oftentimes when we talk about fighting injustices and, you know, <laughs> being an ally to minority communities, uh, I think that can be intimidating to a lot of people. And I think sometimes liberals don't make it seem that easy to get into these things um and i always say like if you can't you know go out and fight for whatever what you can do is you can figure out your own stuff right like i truly believe that time that we spend working on ourselves working on healing ourselves working on taking care of ourselves that is fighting these injustices that is a crucial step in serving our community. Okay, so the next quote that I really liked is from the Pivot 2. 
section. So the second pivot was from transactional to transformative. Uh, And this quote is in the chapter titled Belonging. What kind of mind does it take and what type of practice and commitment does it take to get up and work on something you know will never see physically? To work every day with only a dream and imagination that perhaps the next generations will enjoy what you've created. This is the type of work of belonging. My presence today is the gift of the decisions of a powerful black woman three generations ago who survived slavery of the South as she dreamt of me. What are we working on and toiling over that won't be completed in our lifetime? That's when we know we're actually working on something. I just, I love that so much. I love it so much. There's like a key there, you know, and I feel it. I feel it in my spirit of, and I, I, there's a key here, right? And it makes me think about, you know, when you think about billionaires, for example, and like the, uh, I guess, unethicalness of hoarding a lot of money, it's because they're only thinking about their lifetime and what they can do. Right. Like that's when we end up causing a lot of ills for the world is when we only think about what we can achieve in our lifetime. And yeah, for some people, like what they see is the short term solutions, which is how can I hoard as much money as possible? Right. And but it doesn't create a better future long term for everyone. And I don't know, it's a it's a hard it's, it's something that's hard to sell, I think, to a lot of folks, especially a lot of, like, white Christian <laughs> folks. Like, not to generalize, but this idea of, like, I don't know, caring about other people and caring about other people that ha- don't even exist yet. That idea is so hard to sell to someone. You have to be really grounded spiritually to buy into that and to acknowledge that that is the best way to go. That is the best life to live, even within your own short term life. Right. Like, would you rather be rich, miserable, (laughs) you know, or be like, okay, and have a meaningful life? What are we working on and toiling over that won't be completed in our lifetime? I just ugh, like I just think that's so important. Imagine if we all were just putting seeds, right? For trees that we're never gonna see. That's beautiful, that's powerful, that's love, and that's good karma. That's like that's just so many things. Anyway. Okay, this last chapter that I really like is from the fourth pivot from hustle to flow. This is in the chapter called Flow. Flow occurs not in the absence of obstacles, but because of them. Take, for instance, a river flowing down a hill. Water will flow around a large rock just as easily as a fallen tree. No matter what the obstacle, water will effortlessly seek its inevitable path of least resistance. You may be familiar with Howard Thurman's quote, don't ask yourself what the world needs, ask yourself what makes you come alive and go do that. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. The more we practice flow, the greater possibility there is for social change. I love that. (laughs) Don't ask yourself what the world needs, ask yourself what you need to come alive. Because the world needs people who have come alive. Like, I love that. And no matter the obstacle, water will effortlessly seek its inevitable path of least resistance. I've been thinking about that a lot. Like the path of least resistance. And that is, that's so hard, right? Because... It can be very hard to discern what path is resisting you, right? 
And sometimes you're not going to know right away, right? And sometimes it'll take a couple times for a certain path to be really resistant for you to realize like, okay, I can't go right. I need to go left. Yeah. And I think it's like a muscle that takes practice. uh, And a part of that is having good friends around you, not just yes men, but like people who hold you accountable and to like constantly be very embodied and like self-reflective constantly. Um, Yeah. It's really hard. It's really hard to figure that out. Um, so yeah, so those were all the quotes that I really liked. Um, overall, like, I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure if I needed to read this book. Um, honestly, I was hoping it would give me a little bit more insight as to how to do those things, right? How do you follow the path of least resistance? And it talks about it a little bit, but... I don't know. I guess I just like needed a little bit more, but I'm glad I read it. I'm glad I got to support uh, a black author, a black male author, Dr. Sean Jinwright. Um, I think he's really smart. I think he's on to something. And I think this book is really good if you're interested by this topic, but maybe like not fully uh bought into the idea so for next episode for next month i am going to be talking about all about love by bell hooks and i'm excited to get into that with y'all uh it was really good thank you so much for joining me today uh i think that's all i have all right bye